One of the things I want to start out with is here's a real quick video that uh, shows us on a few different types of fires. One of the things that I'd like you to pay attention when you're watching the videos is the smoke. Watch how quickly the black smoke turns white. With this particular one, wrong spray pattern. Okay, again, as he starts hitting the fire, the black smoke turns white, rapidly extinguishes. Car fire, again, uh, when you're approaching a car fire, I would say that's a little bit of a wrong spray pattern. As we get into it a little bit more, we'll discuss spray patterns and what you're looking for when you're using the product so that you get the benefits of not wasting the product. And that's why I'm here. I'm a lousy salesman. Rather than coming along and saying, hey, I want you to use this stuff and waste it and, you know, you have to come back and buy it, I'm, I'm just the opposite. I know what budgets are like. I know what things are like in the fire service. So what we've done is we started these training programs so that I can come and I can explain to you how to use the product and not waste it. Okay, I want you to use it sparingly. Okay, if, you, if you only need a half a percent, I don't want you using it at 3%. Okay? And you'll find that probably the majority of the instances where you use our product, you're going to be using it at a half to 1%. Very rarely will you need 3%. So as we sit there and we start to talk about it, some of the things that we're going to look at is what is an encapsulator agent. It falls under NFPA 18A, which is a relatively new standard. Okay, it's only been around probably for about four years, and I think it was only ad really adopted within the last uh, year or so. It's a multi-purpose UL class, or CULs, because it's also certified in Canada, a Class A, Class B extinguishing agent, and flammable spill control agent. So when we sit there and we start talking about it, when I would go out and uh, do my hazmat trainings, one thing I would always used to tell and explain to people is watch out for the snake oil salesman. Because you had these people when I was in it that come along and they said they have this product, it's really, really good, it does everything, but there is no standards for it. So, uh, you know, it's, it was always kind of be weary. And now all of a sudden I appear to be that snake oil salesman. However, we have NFPA 18A water additives, which are agent F500 falls under. Okay, that's the one that encapsulator technology falls under. So when you sit there and you start having people come along and say, hey, I have a product that's just as good, it's even better. But then you sit there and you start looking at it and it's a class B foam. Well, how can it be better if it's a class B foam? You can't meet this NFP 18A76 test standard. So you can't be better. Okay, the only standard you meet is the NFPA 11 Class B foam standard, okay, which is tested for burn back resistance and other things. So we'll discuss a whole bunch of things and what we can do and what makes us different than Class B foams as we go through the program. To start with, when we first uh, were introduced to the marketplace, because there was no standard, there was nothing for an encapsulator agent, and we were able to do more, okay, NFPA threw us into the wetting agents category. They never looked at it as anything else. Okay, they never wanted to look at it as anything else until recently. And a lot of it has been because of things that have been done and occurring over in Europe, and we'll talk more about that as we go. But recently, they sat there and they finally came up with the NFPA 18A, and they came up with a test standard. So when we sit there and we start looking at the different products that we have, Wetting agents is really, as long as you can reduce surface tension, that's where you get thrown into. Well, everything that we add to our water foams, they're surface tension reducers. So when you sit there and now you look at class B foams or class A foams, okay, if you're a class A foam, all you really need to do is make bubbles and you're a class A foam. There's no test standard. There's nothing that you have to fall under that makes you a class A foam. When you sit there and start going into the Class B foams, you do have test standards. You have your burn back resistance and different things that you have to meet and criteria that has to be met in order to fall under that Class B uh, foam standard. And the same is going to be with encapsulator technology. The seven, section 7.6 seven, that I showed earlier is that standard. So when we sit there and we start looking, a wetting agent, all it's going to do is make water droplets smaller so that they can get into porous areas, get into tighter areas. When we look at foams, foams are tight, are small, thin-walled bubbles, okay, that have a bubble-to-bubble -bubble inner uh, reaction or inner connection to them. 
And then all of a sudden we get into what we call our MISO, our F500, encapsulator agent. And we'll talk a little bit more about how it's different. So we talked about surface tension reduction. That's common with all of them. But now where we sit there and we start becoming a little bit different in how we make things a little benefit is the rapid and permanent heat re reduction. I take temperatures in excess of 1,500 degrees and I can drop them down to around 100 degrees in a matter of seconds. Okay, and it's permanent. Once I've taken the heat out, it's not going to come back. It's not going to sneak back up on you. It's gone. Okay, the other thing is the encapsulation. We'll talk about all three of these things. And lastly, the interruption of the free radical coalescence. So to get into our firefighter 101, we look at the fire tetrahedron, and we understand that if we remove any one leg of that triangle, the fire is extinguished. Okay, when we sit there and we look at foams, foams create a blanket. Okay, they provide a separation, but they don't do anything to remove the fuel. They don't do anything to remove the heat. So unless you're there to maintain that blanket, okay, once the blanket breaks down, if the heat hasn't been reduced to a point to, of its auto ignition temperature, you're going to have a reignition. So now, to give you a real quick chemistry on our product, encapsulator technology, it's got a, mo a molecule that has a polar head and a nonpolar tail. The polar head loves water, the nonpolar tail hates water, fears water, and wants to get away from it. So when we sit there and we start looking at it going into solution, because it hates water, as it gets introduced into the water stream through your eductors or batch mix, however you introduce it, there's no you know, one way to do it. However it gets added into the water, it works. But anyway, we sit there, when it gets introduced into the water stream, okay, all those tails curve in because they want us to stay away from the water. Okay, they, they fear water, they want to stay away from it. And then as they come through and they start to come out, okay, now all of a sudden we get these tails that start sticking out of the water molecules because now they're outside in the air and they want to get away from the water. But as you see, as we go on, we don't only end up with the ones on the outside, but we also have thousands of these micelles still within each water droplet. It's not just a skin on the surface. It's, you have thousands of these inside, internally within the water droplet. And that's where we make our difference. Because when you sit there and you look at a water molecule, a water molecule, okay, at 212 degrees turns to steam. Okay, and steam conversion is what we're really using right now for extinguishing fires. Okay, you're trying to cool, you hit the, you know, go into a room, a room in contents, you hit the fire, you go ahead and you get that steam blanket, you bunker, hunker down and, you know, wait for the cool off a little bit. Well, now you have the ability to go in and you have the ability to hit that fire, okay, with a different type. Okay, we have a boiling temperature of 248 degrees. You may think, oh my God, just means I'm going to get scalded at a higher temperature. Mm -mm. No, we do not create steam. Okay, there's no steam. We, cre we cool by thermal conveyance. And to give you an idea of what thermal conveyance is, okay, you saw all those little tails that stick out of the water molecule now. Okay, so what happens is as we sit there and we are used in these types of uh, applications, fire, whatever the application may be, okay, you've got this water molecule, you've got these little fingers that act as like heat sinks. So now what they're doing is they're drawing the heat internally into that water molecule where you have more micelles. Okay, so what you've done is you've taken a water droplet that was maybe 10% effective at cooling and you've now made it 90% effective at cooling. So that's where that rapid cooling is going to come into play. So because of that, you're going to need a lot less water. Okay, so if we look at a water droplet, for instance, here like an onion peel, okay, as it approaches and gets closer and closer to the fire, the outer layer peels off, turns the steam, next layer peels off, gets the steam, hits the wall, got a big puddle of water. Okay, well now you have a product that as it goes along, it's going to start absorbing the heat, okay? It's going to start extinguishing the fire because it's cooling, and we know we remove the heat, the fire goes out, okay? 
So you're going to need much less water to extinguish these difficult fires. This video was done at the Georgia Pacific Safety Training Center. And here we're using a 2.5 gallon water extinguisher with a 3% concentration of F500 in it. And they have a laser pyrometer. And if you were to um, have a sound with this particular video, the laser pyrometer is reading somewhere in the area of 13 to 1500 degrees of temperature. The person in the back, he's got, a, again, the 2.5 gallon water can. He's waiting for him to kind of tell him what the temperature is. He's going to spray out of the two and a half gallons, maybe about three quarters of a gallon. Not much, okay? Because F500 is able to rapidly cool, he's now going to pull off his glove. He's going to put his hand on the bare metal, both sides, okay? We've taken the heat. We've reduced it that much, that quickly. So with that being said, you, reduce, you eliminate the heat, eliminate the fire. Another one of our headaches in the fire service is magnesium. We're seeing more and more and more of it, especially in cars. Um, we've got steering columns, steering supports, transmission supports in the frames. Uh, you've got sunroofs, you've got rear hatches on, uh, on cars. There's so many different areas that you have where you have magnesium and when you hit magnesium with water you end up with a mag explosion. Because understanding magnesium and the temperatures it burns at, what ends up happening is the water molecules, when it hits that high of a temperature, it splits that water molecule into its two properties, hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, well, what do we send rockets to the moon with? Okay, so that's why you're ending up with your explosions, because you're splitting the water molecules. So here's an example of F500 being used on a magnesium fire, okay, at a 3% concentration. Again, rapidly cools. He's going to go over. He's going to take a quick look at it. He's going to take his glove off, and he's going to hand it off. So I mentioned that with foam, you create that blanket. Okay, that blanket holds the heat in, so you have to continue to apply it until you get to below the auto ignition temperature. Until you're able to get below that point, okay, you have everything you need for reignition. With F500, as you can see, we can, in a matter of seconds, drop a temperature down below the auto ignition temperature and take the heat out of the equation rather fast. So after talking about the heat, Let's talk about what the encapsulation side of F500 is. We're able to encapsulate carbon and hydrocarbon molecules. Okay, and the way we do it is we trap them within our water molecules, our little micelles, with the kinetic energy that's used when we sit there and we hit or as we're spraying across the surface of a flammable liquid. The vapors, we can encapsulate vapors as well as liquids. So these are able to trap and encapsulate these hydrocarbons and carbon molecules, and once we've encapsulated them, we don't release them. Okay, we keep them and hold on to them. So that being said, when you sit there and you start looking at a, let's say, a liquid spill, that gas spill on the highway, um, that right now you might be throwing sand or kitty litter on. If we look at the EPA's rules and regs, we're supposed to be sweeping it up and disposing of it uh, at a hazardous waste landfill, and you own it for life. Okay, with F500 being used at a 3% concentration on these types of roadway incidents or spills, you can wash it down, get your LEL meter out, test it. Your LEL meter reads zero. Let it evaporate away. You're good. Okay, it's done. It will not reignite, no matter how long it sits. We encapsulate it within the micelles, the molecules, just they're held in there. And uh, what we then do is if it's something that's off, uh, let's say on the gravel portion of the roadway, you can also use it on those areas. And what will happen is we'll also act as an encapsulator agent on those soil areas. And you can sit there and come back and test those areas within oh, six to eight months. There'll be no sign of F500 or the hydrocarbon. 
Uh, we were used and approved by the EPA for the Colonial Pipeline spill, 230,000 gallons of gas. It was back in, I think, September of last year by the EPA for that purpose. So now when we sit there and we start looking at that encapsulation properties, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to go and show a couple of videos that um, are going to show the difference of F500 versus foam. As you're aware, foam, there's only three application techniques that can be used. Okay, you either rain it in, roll it on, or bank it. Well, if you've got an open pit, okay, one, if you're trying to rain it in, the heat, as we talked earlier, foams are just a thin wall bubble. Okay, as you start raining it down, the heat is just going to evaporate those bubbles away. So it's going to take a lot to cool it before that foam can start to extinguish, before it starts attacking it. Because you have small sides, okay, this could be one where you could roll it on, but you're not going to bank it in because there's nothing to bank it with. This is jet fuel at 3%, only 95 GPM nozzle. And one of the things, again, pay attention to the black smoke, how quickly it uh, turns white. Uh, some of the things that I want to point out so that you get a little bit of an idea of how to use the product is as they're extinguishing this fire, you want to go at it with probably about a 30 degree fog pattern and rapidly sweep across the surface. Okay, one of the things that you want to do is you want to get rid of the heat. Okay, so as you sit there and you rapidly sweep across, you start knocking the fire down rather quickly, the heat's gone. You're not going to beat yourself up with a bunch of heat. So now you've got the heat gone, he's sitting there and he's going around, he's cooling the edges of the metal around the side. Right now the fire's out. He's a little overkill. But the fire's out. Could I sit there and go and throw a match in there and relight it? Probably. And we'll talk about that. There's a formula. But that just proves how quickly I can extinguish a difficult fire. Another thing that we know about foams and other extinguishing agents is they don't work on a three-dimensional fire. NFPA even states that foam cannot be used on a three-dimensional fire. It won't extinguish it. So if you've got a hill, you've got something where gasoline's rolling down and you're trying to extinguish it currently with foams, water, or whatever you're using, it's just going to run on the surface and continue to flow. Okay, with encapsulator technology, okay, you're going to be able to extinguish those types of fires. Here's a mock-up of a jet engine cowling. They're using salt water, 3%, again, only a 95 GPM nozzle. As they're sitting there and they're going through, the only thing that I can do, again, because of some of the things that I've learned about the product, um, and one of the things, that, again, pointing out, is as you can see, spraying off to the side at first. And then you'll see that white discoloration on the water. That's why he was spraying. He wants to make sure he has F500 in his hose stream before he makes his attack. Right now he's kind of concentrating somewhat on the fire, but if you were to concentrate a little bit more on the steel at first to cool the steel, you probably would have had the fire out a little bit quicker. But I believe he gets that fire put out somewhere in the area of about 23 to 28 seconds. Okay, that's not bad. Foam, you would have been there. You would have used probably every drop of foam that you had and call the airport crash truck and use all their foam and you'd still have the fire burning. Foams will not put out that type of a fire. So I can put out these difficult fires relatively easily. Again, here's just an example of a pressurized distillation column. To show an example of the difficult pressurized fires, spraying fires. The only thing is, when you start getting into some of these types of situations, while yes, I, I can be able to put those fires out, we hope to have somebody close by to turn the valve to shut off the, the fuel supply. Okay. So as I mentioned, while I can put out all these difficult fires, I'm not going to just sell you my product and not tell you the downside of my product. Okay, I do have an Achilles heel. While I can put out these difficult fires, I do not create a blanket. So by not being able to create a blanket, I can't suppress vapors. So when you start getting into these large fires, a 9,000 gallon gasoline tanker, that big pit like I showed, where they're going and they're putting in 100 gallons or however many gallons of a flammable liquid, 
we can sit there and we can sweep across we can put that fire out rather quickly however I after the fires out I haven't applied enough product to hit this formula one part of an encapsulator agent eight parts of fuel 40 parts water and kinetic energy I haven't hit that formula to encapsulate that much product therefore if it hits an ignition source you have a reignition okay so let's think about this for a minute and consider that 9,000 gallon gasoline tanker going down the highway flips over catches fire okay you arrive on scene you sit there and you start looking at it you know the foam's not going to work on it well hey about 40 gallons of encapsulator concentrate you're going to have that fire out in fact I'd be willing to bet you after you get used to and do a little bit of training with it get really good at it you can probably put it out with a lot less and you probably have the fire out less than two minutes However, within that two minutes, you haven't applied enough F500 to encapsulate 9,000 gallons of gasoline. So here's your Class B foam. Here's the use for it. So I'm not trying to replace foams. I can't replace foams. Foams still have their place. I just want to be another tool in your toolbox to help you extinguish those fires so they're not causing a bunch of damage to your infrastructure, not making it where instead of being uh, having to replace the roadway after this tankers burn down to nothing okay because again we talk about that tanker and I can even show you a video that was shot in uh, in Vietnam where because that tanker truck again there's only the three methods to apply foam and if you can't hit and be, apply it in one of those three methods foam will not extinguish the fire you're just going to make a bigger mess so I mentioned how the roadway okay the gasoline we have a spill on the ground. This is just a real quick uh, example of being able to encapsulate. They're sitting there and they're showing you how the F500, just a little bit on the ground at 3%, is able to encapsulate the fuel on half of the spill. Okay, the other half burns rather readily. Now he's going to come along, he's going to sweep across. And then he's going to give it a little bit of overkill. He's going to go back and fires out, and now he's going to go back and respray where he already sprayed. Is he trying to encapsulate the rest of it? Right. He, encapsul he encapsulated all of it. Now, if you went back with an LEL read meter, it reads zero. Instead, they're using that, uh, uh, I resemble it, but he's using the Polish LEL meter, the little torch there. So. But again, as you can see, as he's using the torch, he's walking through it, okay? You can't do that with foam. You disturb that foam blanket in any way, you're gonna have, you're gonna have fire, okay? We're encapsulating it. We're, we're going to sit there and we're going to trap those flammable molecules within our micelles and we're not going to release them. And I'm not, again, if you look at that NFPA 7.6 test, and we can sit there and I can, I can do it for you. A gallon of gas, I've got a pan. We can get a gallon of gas, um, and the test is what you do is it's a gallon of gas, 16 ounces of our concentrate, and five gallons of water. Okay, after we've encapsulated it, we let it set for two minutes, put a torch to it, it should not light. And then I should be able to come back to it two hours later put a torch to it and it still won't light. Okay? And the reason why they give the two hour time limit is because foams, class B foams, will break down to a point where if you put the torch to the gas, it will burn. So foams cannot meet that standard while encapsulators can't meet foam standards. It's kind of a double-edged sword. So this is probably the section that I like the most uh, when we sit there and we start looking at it, having been a firefighter and wanting to lose that 40 pounds off my back or 30 pounds off my back, depending on whether you're using steel bottles or composites, um, I used to like to throw my air pack off as soon as I could, and it was probably sooner than I should have. And then all of a sudden, as I started working for the company, I came across this uh, Clemson report. And I was rather intrigued by it, and I, I started to tell the uh, president of the company that we're missing the boat with cancer being what it is in the fire service we need to sit there we need to start getting the message out 
This study was done by a Clemson grad student, and what he did is he took toluene, and he did some tests because as we were so looking at the videos, I kept asking you to watch that black smoke turn white. Okay, that's F500, that's encapsulator agent, basically encapsulating and, and stopping that free radical chain reaction from occurring. So as they sat there and they did the uh, test, what they did is they were looking at three things. One, they wanted to see the light, they wanted to check the visibility as far as the soot, and then they looked at the soot and the soot buildup. So when they sat there and they did the same test now using F500, okay, they noticed that there was a 68% increase in visibility without adding any type of extra ventilation. Excuse me. Okay, the reduction in the soot buildup, 97%. But the big thing was a 98.6% reduction in soot toxicity. Okay, that's huge, especially with how many incidents we're having of cancer in the fire service. So we took it a step farther, and what we did is we got a sample of some runoff water and we sent it into a lab, and these are just a list of some of the carcinogens that we were able to identify, or the lab was able to identify, that we're able to encapsulate and take out of the, out of the water or out of the smoke, okay, when we're used in uh, extinguishing fires. So that's huge, okay. So we talked about all the different technologies, what we're bringing as far as the fire suppression mechanics, the um, surface tension reduction, the heat, and now we talked about the interruption of the free radical coalescence. As I mentioned earlier, we are listed with the EPA on their uh, national contingency plan as a surface washing agent. Some of the reasons why are we're non-corrosive, okay, we have no fluorines, we're non-toxic, and we're biodegradable. So when you use this, we don't stay in the environment. Okay? We're not going to sit there and add or be used as a fertilizer. We're not going to cause algae if we run off into waterways or some of the other things that other products do. So what we do is we like to consider ourselves that new third category of agent, where foams and other products can only extinguish the two-dimensional Class A and Class B fires, or even the Class K fires, we can work on the three-dimensional. We can work on the difficult ones. Now, I mentioned that I want to uh, talk about a little bit about uh, some of the savings. As you can see, these are just some of the other areas where we were used as far as municipal fire, power companies. Uh, petrochemicals, they're finally starting to look at us a lot in the areas of uh, spills, petroleum spills, rubber industry, um, they're using us quite a bit. So when we sit there and we start looking, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that structural firefighting side of it. Okay, so we talked about the encapsulation, we talked about the reduction in heat, and we talked about no steam creation. Okay, so what does that mean if we're sitting there and we have a structure fire? Okay, well, if you go to a structure right now, currently, you're sitting there and you're making entry, if it's a room in contents with possible victims inside, you're trying to get a search and rescue set up. If you sit there and start hitting the fire, you're gonna create a superheated steam. So now, if you do have victims that are inside, you're just increasing the temperatures for them. Um, you're really not doing anything to help with visibility. You're not really doing anything as far as the soot and toxicity until you start getting some ventilation going. Okay, now all of a sudden you have this new tool in your toolbox. It's called encapsulator agent. Okay, you make entry, you find your room and contents, you hit the fire. Okay, the minute you hit the fire, your visibility is going to be increased before any ventilation is taking place. You're improving your visibility. Okay, you've taken the heat out of the equation. So now instead of hitting the fire and having to hit the floor because the steam blanket's going to hit, come down and hit you, you're going to hit the fire and you're going to stand up because your visibility is increased and there's no steam. Okay, so what does that do for your victims if there are any? Well, you're not going to expose them to the superheated ste steam, and you're going to make it easier for the search and rescue crew to find them because you've improved the visibility by putting the fire out. So we're changing the whole game of fighting fires. Okay, so what does that do for you as an individual? 
well, hopefully it's going to reduce your stress level because now you're able to see a little bit. You're going to put the fire out faster. So now with the high temperatures that you're going to get starting to get into here and in, during the summer months, high humidity, okay, hopefully that's going to be a little bit less stress on yourselves, your bodies, because you're not going to be on scene as long, okay, and less fatigue. Okay, when we sit there and we start looking at what are the causes of fire ground, firefighter injuries on the fire ground, stress and fatigue. Okay, these are two areas that I can help eliminate those problems with. Now I say I'm in the demos that I was showing or the videos that I was showing, you saw a lot of the videos were at 3%. And I sat there and I said, now I want to come along and teach you how to use the product so you're not wasting it. When you sit there and you look at those structure fires, half. 1% is all you need, okay, for a structure fire. Okay, if you have an exposure and you spray that exposure down with the 1% concentration of F500, don't even look at it, give it a second look and take it out of the equation. Okay, a 1% uh, concentration of F500 and I'll get the chief of a video of a test that was done in California where they sprayed a, um, a room of a hotel that they're getting ready to burn and some telephone poles. Um, and he can get it up, uh, let everybody view it. But uh, it's, I believe it's on our website. But they have a uh, telephone pole that they treated in like 45 minutes with, with flame impingement and heat in excess of 1,500 degrees and the telephone pole still isn't burning. Okay, so we can sit there and we can give you some really, really good burn back resistance and we can take some of the, your exposures out of the equation. Um, the last thing is, uh, I, I was telling the chief earlier, I had a department up in Michigan that uh, they gave, they were, they were a rough crowd. Um, I got all the, we have fire hydrants and we don't need your product. We got all the water we need and take your garbage and get it the heck out of the station. and. Uh, of course, they used a little bit more colorful language, but uh, uh, I sat there and I, for the next, oh, I don't know, four months or so, sent multiple emails and multiple phone calls to the training officer and never got a response, never re replied back to me. And then all of a sudden, about seven months after I was there doing the training, I see a request for a quote come across my emails and I was like, whoa, what's going on? And two days after I saw that quote come through, the training officer's calling me up. And he is sitting there, he's telling me, man, he says, you know how those guys are giving you such a hard time because they had the hydrants and they have all the water they need? And I said, yeah. He said, well, he said, we had a truck fire out on the highway. He said, they didn't have their hydrants. He said, so dispatch sent three units out there. He said, the first unit that arrived on scene was a pumper carrying 1,000 gallons of water. They hit that truck with 1,000 gallons of water. He said, didn't have any effect. Didn't, didn't even phase the fire. He said, so here comes a second pumper. It arrives on scene. It dumps 1,000 gallons of water. He said, didn't touch the fire. He said, now the third unit coming in was a heavy rescue that carried 500 gallons of water and F500. He said they didn't use all 500 gallons of water and they extinguished the fire. Okay? So you're going to find that these difficult fires are going to be a lot easier to extinguish using much less water. And when we sit there and we start looking at what we have to look forward to. Okay, let's think about the cars now with the magnesium. Now, when we saw the demo in the videos, the demo said 3% on magnesium. And we know that vehicles are getting more and more and more parts that are magnesium, okay? 1% on a car fire is all you need, okay? There's not enough magnesium that I'm gonna say use 3%. You will see at 1%, it is going to be effective. You may have a spark that might fly off. It looks like a kid's sparkler on the 4th of July, but that's going to be about it. You will not have a magnesium explosion with a car at 1%. Again, though, make sure you bleed the line. Make sure you have that white discoloration in the water before you attack the fire, because if not, you're hitting it with just straight water. Okay? The only difference that you'll find when you sit there and start going down to a lesser concentration of F500 or encapsulator agents when you start getting into these car fires is going to be you might have to flow water for a little bit longer period of time because you have fewer micelles to help with the cooling. 
Okay, so instead of being able to extinguish that magnesium in a minute or two minutes, you might have to flow it for two and a half to three minutes. But it will go out without a mag explosion. So you can get by with 1% on your car fires. The fuel fires, and if you have fuel spills, trans fluid, oils, and things like that that you want to kind of do a little cleanup afterwards, bump it up to 3%, give it a real quick wash down at 3%. If it's gas, diesel, use your LEL meter, make sure it's zero. As long as it's zero, let it evaporate away, you're done, you're good. Okay, so with those, you're only going to need the smaller applications. So hopefully, by explaining that to you, you'll see that what I'm trying to do is, is, is one, a few things, hopefully a little bit less wear and tear on your bodies, but I want you to use it efficiently and effectively so that, again, you're not wasting the product, okay? Bad salesman, but still, um, I don't want you to waste it. That's why I'm here. I want to make sure you're using it correctly. We're not foam. We don't create blanket, uh, blankets. Um, so with that being said, are there any questions? Not a problem. Not a problem. There's, well, as far as mixing, there's, there's, like I say, class B, there's actually class B foams that don't play well together because of the different manufacturers. Um, we're no different. If you sit there and um, you mix us with a class B foam in the tank, yeah, we're not going to play well. No, there's no problem. There's no problem. No, I just, as far as mixing together, yeah, as far as mixing together, no. Uh, and, and that's one of the areas when I sit there and, and I've uh, approached uh, Pueblo, Colorado and some of these other areas. And, and in fact, if there's any hazmat people here, WMD um, type people, uh, if we sit there and you start looking at many of your products that are out there on the marketplace as far as uh, homegrown terrorists uh, and things like that, some of, some of your bio agents, and you look at what's used to help spread them, it's usually a petroleum base. Well, I encapsulate petroleum products, so I'm trying to see if we can't, um, even with uh, the government, get some testing done to see if we can't help with deconning some of those agents and maybe possibly neutralizing them. Because we encapsulate oils and, 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 and things like that, so. If it's a large, yeah, if it's a large spill, yeah, if it's, if it's a really large spill, correct, correct. I mean, once the fire's out, I've done my job, okay? You know, you have that 9,000 gallon spill, you have that huge spill that's, that's on fire and burning. I mean, once I've put the fire out, unless you want to use, you know, 3,000 gallons of my concentrate to encapsulate 9,000 gallons, I mean, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll deliver it myself. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, exactly. Um, again, you know, unless unless you have that much product where you can encapsulate that many gallons of gasoline and hit that formula, why? Okay, let's put the fire out, and once you've used my product to do its job, now I've made it easier for you to use foam, and it, it, so it can do its job. Um, as a real quick example, let me. Uh, Okay, this is a video that was shared with me down in, uh, or I should say over in Vietnam. Eh. Doesn't want to play here now, what's going on? Mm. Yeah, I figures it froze up on me. This is the one right here, yeah. Okay, so here's a real easy example, an example of a small tanker truck fire that because foam can't be used correctly on this fire, as I said. 
three methods. Rain it down, bank it in, or roll it on. You can't roll it on that, it's too high. Right now, as you can see, and, and this is common. I mean, there's a lot of departments. I'm not gonna just blame Vietnam, but I mean, you sit there and you look at a lot of departments, big cities, little cities, wherever, because they have no way to get the foam in there and they're trying to put the fire out, okay? All you're doing is making what F500 could have had out. This, this is probably less than five gallons of concentrate to extinguish that fire. And look at all the foam. So when we sit there, we start looking and talking about savings. Okay, where does the, the savings come in? How, okay, well look at how much foam you've put on the ground. Okay, and as I said, I could probably have that out with about maybe a gallon of concentrate, the 3%. Again, there's, there's no way to bake it in. Raining it down isn't going to work because of the heat. It's just going to continue to cause the bubbles to evaporate away and have no effect. And now all of a sudden we've overspilled and now we get the dry cam and the powder extinguishers out. Foam would work there. Yeah, foam would work as long as, long as you weren't walking through it. <coughs> Yeah. So, it's just a real quick, idea, you know, an example of where F500 could be very beneficial. Now, here you had a rather small fire just off the top of the tank, okay? F500 rapidly sweeping across. You saw the big pits that we extinguished. You saw the jet cowling mock-up that we did, all in less than a minute. But we've been, well, this is just an example. We've been used on energized electrical transformers. Um, there's testing that was done with FDNY and Con Edison. And we've got SOGs that they helped create and shared with us where they had a electrical transformer. And you might say, well, why would they want to even consider doing that? Well, in New York, if you have a transformer that fails, you figure it's going to black out a pretty good portion of the, of the community. and and so on. So they started to look at and come up with ideas on how they could deal with it, especially after they had a transformer where when they went to uh, extinguish it, they started out using water, which had no effect on it. And then they switched over to foam and the foam had no effect on it. And then they went over to Purple K and Purple K had no effect. And now by the time they've used all these agents and the water and everything else, they started to overflow the con containment dike and it went down into a, a waterway which led to millions of dollars in fines to Con Edison. They decided that they were going to sit there and start doing some testing and research on other extinguishing agents and they started looking at encapsulator technology. Um, so they did come up with some SOGs where we are safely uh, able to be used on energized electrical transformers to extinguish them. And uh, we've actually had, oh, within the last, I'm going to say within the last couple of months, uh, I think it was been four transformers that have been extinguished um, using F500. And it's been done in usually under four minutes where we're able to extinguish these types of fires. Um, and again, those, those are all things we can share. I'm not telling you, hey, change your, change your SOGs or anything like that. But even if it's de-energized, Okay, after they've de-energized the oils and the things and the transformers with the heat sinks, they hold a lot of heat. And trying to put that out with water, 
you'll be there and I can I know I was on one we were there for a weekend trying to put out a uh, a, actually, it was being a, it was a scrap transformer that they were trying to get rid of, and it was just residual oil on it. They were cutting it up with a torch, and it burned for a weekend because we couldn't put it out. The S500 has been tested up to 325,000 volts. Is that yes. Yeah, we have the SOGs on it. It's not going to be our practice. No. Fire electrical equipment. No. It's nice to know if you are trying to put out a PCB fire or something like that, and something happens and it gets energized, at least you have some protection. Right. We have standoff distances that would be more than happy to share. Um, again, I'm not trying to say, hey, change your policies or procedures. Keep them the way they are. They're, it, it's safer. Um, that's just something that F, FDNY and Con Edison done. But again, what they did is it, it's a partnership, so the fire department just doesn't arbitrarily come up onto a burning transformer and start applying it. They wait till a Con Edison employee uh, arrives on scene so that they make sure that they have that that connection between the two agencies. So whatever the policies and procedures are here, I'd s stay with them. Big thing is, is on the de-energized electrical transformers, you have a tool in your toolbox where you won't be there for days and days and days. Um, do you have a lot of problems with straw and hay? Not too much? Occasionally. Okay. Cotton? Okay. Those are going to be a little bit more difficult because those can start to become a deep-seated and it's going to be, again, our product, while it's able to do some amazing things, we have to get to the seat of the fire. Um, so just because we're putting the fire out and we're offering some really, really good burn back resistance, um, on, you still have to do your overhaul. Get to the seat, make sure that you got all the hot spots extinguished, you get those done, I guarantee you won't get a call back for re rekindle. If, um, Typically, what we get is either piled cotton or baled cotton. Okay. And our overhaul involves heavy equipment, you know, forklifts or bale haulers or even front end loaders. And what they do typically, especially with the piled stuff, is they spread it out on the ground where it's like a foot or two feet thick. And I think this will really help with that. Yeah, it will. And then they bury it. I mean, they, they end up having to bury the cotton. Okay. Yeah. Well, one of the things I mentioned as far as the burn back resistance, and just to give you an idea, um, and I'm sure every community's got those people where, you know, they have their brush piles or they've got their leaves and whatnot, and they're burning them when they're not supposed to, and you get the call that, hey, so-and-so is here, and he's got a fire going, and so you respond, and you put the fire out, and next thing you know, an hour and a half later, you're getting a call back because you got it relit. Well, 1% of F500 on his brush pile and I'll guarantee you, six months later, unless he goes out and buys a boatload of fuel or accelerant to keep get, generate enough heat to get it going, I'd be willing to bet you six months later that pile's still there because of the burn back resistance that we offer. He won't get it relit with just a, a torch or a little bit of, because if he puts uh, accelerant on it, diesel, gas, or whatever, and tries to light it, it'll burn off. And, once it burns off, fires out. It won't. He's gonna have to generate a lot of heat to get it to relight. So the question on the structural firefighting side. Yes. Uh, on arson cases or something where they use accelerants, is that gonna destroy? Good question. No, it will not. Um, we have uh, testing that was done. And if you use arson dogs to assist, the arson dogs will still hit on any place where an accelerant was used. Um, while we're able to encapsulate, one of the things we don't do is a lot of times like that uh, benzenes, the uh, aromatic hydrocarbons in the chains and stuff like that, we aren't able to really mass that scent, so they're able to still hit on it. Okay. Yes. Not just the dogs. Right. The lab will still be able to find it. One of the things that uh, I would make a recommendation for is just to help the lab out in identifying what is and what isn't is if you give them a sample of F500 um, as a, uh, basically a control um, so that they can sit there and they can, they can identify what's F500 and, 
and what is accelerants and so on, that would, that would make it easier for him to identify. Any other questions? I guess with that, I mean, if you have an investigator come out and he is going to send something off to lab, just be sure to tell him since this is new, I'm going to school them up on this stuff. Mm -hmm. Be sure to remind them. So what's kind of on the same page, but different? What is, what is, say we have a diesel spill and we go use this on 50 gallons. What is the product that's left when we leave? Just the encapsulated reagent water with the diesel encapsulated within it. We evaporate, we evaporate away. Yep. Yep. No. No, we, we evaporate away, and when we evap when L500 and the encapsulated reagent evaporates, it's taking the diesel with it or the gas. Um, if it gets into the soil, as we've heard many times, they talk about the enzymes that eat the petroleum products. Uh, well, we're, we're different. I mean, microblaze has an effect on that, but what you're doing is you're adding organisms to the soil. We're not adding any organisms. What we're doing is if you look at, um, let's say, a petroleum product as it enters into the soil, okay, it becomes like, let's say, a glob like my fist. Okay, so the enzymes that are in the soil, they're able to work and they're able to eat that surface. Okay, and once they eat the surface, okay, now they got to get to the next layer and the next layer. Again, let's look at that onion, you know, until it gets all of it, okay, and it's able to uh, digest all of that petroleum, which is going to be a very time-consuming task for it. Now, you sit there and you start using an encapsulator agent, and what we do is instead of allowing it to become a ball, okay, we make it, let's say, like a piece of paper. We spread it out, giving it more surface area. So now what's happening is the natural occurring enzymes that are in the soil are able to digest and eat that petroleum product much faster, much quicker. So you come back in a matter of months and you do a soil sample, there'll be no trace that there is a spill there and there'll be no trace that there's F500 ever used because we biodegrade without adding enzymes. That's why the EPA likes us. Any other questions? Okay, one of the other things that I do, and this again, you won't be what you'll see from many salesmen, is I always put a stack of business cards up front. Okay, because of the simple fact that as far as I'm concerned, you're not only buying product, you're buying services. Okay, and that being said, if ever you go out on a fire scene and the product doesn't work the way you saw it on the videos and the way we're going to go out and see it demonstrated, I don't want to hear about it two, three weeks later. I expect a phone call, and I don't care if it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay, let's talk about and figure out what's going on and why the product isn't working. Okay? So feel free to take a business card. Feel free to, you know, put my contact information in the trucks or any of the vehicles that use the F500 product. Um, and again, um, I'm here to be of service and help out any way I can and answer questions. So if you have questions later on down the road, by all means, let the chief know and uh, we'll get in touch with you. I'll be more than happy to answer those questions as they come up, especially after you get a chance to use it a few times. Okay. So we'll head out to the airport, do some burns. We're going to do a full fire, a three dimensional fire in the armed burn pit. If y'all want to sign some money, we'll do the firefighting. And we've got 